If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it. Turn once again to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, where today we come to our sixth installment, believe it or not, um, through the series that we're calling The Letters, focusing in on the specific letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And what we've been learning, uh, to kind of summarize it in one sentence, is we're learning what God is inviting us into if we are in Christ Jesus. But before we get into the word of God, let's once again go before the throne room of God and, and pray over this service. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. God, we thank you for the peace and the joy that you bring to our lives and that you bring to this church. There's so much joy inside the walls of Faith Community Church, and we thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray that for every individual person, it's sometimes the, the wrong way to word it in a terms of a congregation because everybody under the sound of my voice is dealing with their own challenges right now. But I pray that as we get into your word, that any fear, any discouragement, any depression, any insecurity, anything that's keeping your people up at night because they're troubled by it, God, I pray that those feelings would diminish over the course of hearing your word and being in your presence and God, that instead our hope and our confidence and our faith in you, God, I pray that that would increase in the heart and the mind of every person who's in church today. I pray that we would leave this church, we would leave this place assured that you who began a good work in us, namely the good work of salvation, would be faithful to complete it. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. 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 All right, the Bible should be open to Ephesians chapter 2. And we will now, for the second week in a row, look at this very important and powerful passage. We spent all last Sunday looking at it, but I want to lock in one more time on the first five verses of Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all, say all, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. This text is considered the simplest and most direct presentations of the message of Jesus Christ that you're gonna find anywhere in scripture. These verses in the original language, these first five verses that we just read, originally were all one long sentence. And if you were just to boil it down, what it is, is it's the message of the gospel. It's the message that we were dead but God made us alive in Christ Jesus. And listen, that's the message of Christianity. That's the message of this text. And that's the message of the gospel that we believe. By nature, we were all dead, but God is making people alive in Christ. To put it another way, there was a massive problem, but praise be to God, he has given us an incredible solution. Now, what's interesting to me about this as we preach this for the second week in a row is that everyone agrees that there's a problem. Regardless of your church background, regardless of, of your own personal statement of faith, people all over the world agree that there's a problem. Nobody disputes that. Everybody knows that something's wrong with us. This is why we all have New Year's resolutions. This is why we all have goals and aspirations. This is why we all say things like, Ugh, I've got to get back in the gym. Um, I, I need to be more disciplined. I got to have a better routine. I need to stop eating so much junk food and fast food. You know, this is why we all say things like, man, I've got to get a handle on my finances. I have more months than I do Mondays, or money Mondays, <laughs> than I do money. Um, I've got to save more. I've got to give more, right? We, we all say, regardless of our creed, regardless of our, our statement of faith, we all say things like, man, I need to be less passive and more courageous as a leader. I need to be a better friend, a better spouse, a better parent. I need to be a better person. In, in other words, what I'm trying to say to you is that we all look at the different things that are happening in our lives 
And though the, the details of those things may be different, the heart of the response is the same. And that is we're all regularly saying something along the lines of, I need to be more of this and I need to be less of that. This is why self-help books and self-help podcasts and TED Talks and leadership conferences are always the biggest sellers and the best attended because we all need help and we all know it. Now, where we differ, where we pivot away is with the question of, well, what's the nature of the problem? What's the nature of the problem that we all admit that we have? And then the question of, well, how bad is the problem, right? In other words, how bad am I? How bad are we? How bad is the world? And listen, that is such an important question to ask and to pursue, to answer. I mean, most everyone admits that there's something wrong with the world generally and wrong with other people specifically. Like, we know there's crime and abuse. We don't have to look far to see all the deceit and the division of the world. We see the prejudice. We see the injustice. We see the hatred. We see the evil and horrible things happening to and through humanity all the time. But knowing the nature of the problem, that is to say knowing the causation, the root of the problem, knowing how bad said problem is, is crucially important for us to start with. And here's why. Because the magnitude of the solution is directly proportionate to the magnitude of the problem. You're going to hear that a lot today. And that's just the case of any problem, right? I mean, it, think about it in a medical term. Um, if, if you got a little cut, a boo-boo, you might need to put a Band-Aid on it, right? If, if you got the flu, then you might need some medication and three to five days of bed rest. If you get cancer, then you're going to need a specialist. You're going to need chemotherapy. You're going to need radiation. You're going to need surgery and probably an extended amount of time in the hospital. But if you're dead, then the solution to your problem would be a miracle of God. And that's why I'm saying that the magnitude of the solution is directly proportionate to the magnitude of the problem. So the question becomes, how bad off are we anyway? I mean, if we just need a little bit of encouragement, then all we need is a good friend. If we just need to get moving, then what we need is a personal trainer. If we just need to get our life back on track, then I guess all we need is a good life coach. But if we're dead, then what we need is a supernatural miracle from God himself. And so we've got to figure out exactly what's wrong with us. We've got to start there because, again, the strength of the cure is proportionate to the strength of the disease. Two years ago, I was interviewed by um, a secular news outlet. It was a radio station out of Santa Fe, and somebody had recommended me in the church that I was pastoring to be interviewed. They were talking about, you know, places that are involved in their community and making a, a big impact. And so they wanted to interview me and as a pastor and, and, and wanted to know about more about the church. And so I was asked, well-intendedly, by this radio host over the phone, he was like, so tell us, Pastor Tim, what's your primary objective and goal? Tell us what your church is about and, and what you're most passionate about. And I said, well, the answer to all of the above is Jesus. I said, I'm passionate about, and we as a church exist to preach and to proclaim and to live out the gospel truth that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us, to redeem us, to save us because we were a mess and we can't fix us. And so I'm about, and we collectively are about pointing people to the cure for the disease of our soul. The disease is sin. The result of that disease is eternal death, but the cure is Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> I even told the guys, like, I felt like you just lobbed me an easy softball question. That's right up my alley. But what was funny is I felt like it kind of threw him off. He didn't know exactly where to go with the interview next. I'm sure the, the secular listening audience was like, what is happening right now? Why? Why would they feel that way? Because here's the truth. Sadly, when most people think of a modern American church, I think a lot of them are just like, oh, I just figured the church was a place to get encouraged and a place to kind of get excited and to pump people up and, and to do good things. I figured, you know, that you as a pastor of a growing church with a lot of young people were just about helping people live their best life and about helping them get through their day and take on the struggles of their week. 
Okay, but listen, if that's all I'm doing is pumping you up and building you up, then that is not nearly strong enough to address our collective problem. The reality is we need something far stronger than just self-help and excitement and encouragement. Because again, how big is our problem? We need to know that. And yet what's also true is it doesn't really matter in one sense how bad we think the problem is because we misdiagnose ourselves all the time. I had a buddy just recently, about two years ago now, he was 39 years old at the time. He's been a lifelong friend. Um, and at the age of 39, he had a major, a major stroke, almost took his life. By the grace of God, he did survive. Um, and even now, uh, two and a half years later, he's still trying to regain his strength. He still talks with a slur. Um, he's just now started going back to, to the gym, doing light workouts. He can walk for like a mile without you know, being exhausted, but he's getting stronger every day, praise God. But um, a, about a month or so after his stroke, I talked to him. I went to visit him, in the, and he was still in ICU. And I said, bro, what happened? What happened? And he said, well, I started having chest pains. And he goes, and I just thought it was the Mexican food. I thought that Mexican takeout last night was getting me. In other words, his self-diagnosis was acid reflux. But the actual diagnosis, the reality of what he was actually facing was he had a blood clot moving through his legs and his arteries, even passing through his heart, which should have killed him. My buddy felt that something was off. He knew he had a problem. He thought it was pozole and green chile, amen? <laughs> but it was death knocking at his door. And so similarly, so many of us, so many people in the world will go, ah, man, I'm just, I've just been having a rough go. I just need to be encouraged. I just need to be reminded of what's good. I just need someone to kind of lift my spirits and maybe go to a church where the pastor makes me laugh. And I just, I'm just, life is hard. I just need to be encouraged. Okay, but the reality is we need to know what God says. You think that's your problem, but we need to know what God says about our problem. We need to know what God is saying about our condition. Because if we want to receive the necessary cure, then we have to start by knowing how bad the disease of our soul is. You see, the fact of the matter is, when you look at the Bible's assessment of us, it's much worse than you may think. It's much worse than you think. And yet the good news of the gospel, the good news is that the solution and the cure to our problem is much better than we would have ever dared dream, imagine, or asked for. So let's start with this. What is the biblical diagnosis? Again, verse one says, and you were, what's the word? Dead. dead. Muerte. No life. You were dead in your trespasses and dead in your sin. So when the Bible is searching for an explanation of what's wrong with us, it says that you weren't just a little misadjusted. You weren't just a little mistreated. You, you weren't just tired and bored and in a rut. You're not just a little discouraged, despondent, or depressed. You don't just need a little pick-me-up. No, you are dead. How many of you would raise your hand and agree that that's strong language? That's a strong word. Um, up until three years ago now, I had never had any firsthand experience with a dead body. Uh, but on, I think it was April 3rd, 2020, my father, with the dignity of being in his home, uh, surrounded by his family, passed from this world to eternity. And when dad died, I remember looking at him and we knew it was coming. We had set up a bed in the living room that he had laid on for a couple of days as he um, passed on. And I remember looking at his lifeless body and I don't know if you've ever had this experience with someone you love, but as I looked at him, it's just this weird feeling of waiting. I just kept waiting for his eyes to blink, kept waiting for his chest to expand, for his chest to move. I just kept waiting for him to take another breath, but it didn't happen. And so about an hour later after the nurse had come in and done whatever they do to you know, make, make it official, um, the nurse, my brother and I, my brother-in-law and I were tasked to move my dad's body off of the bed. And so as we lifted dad's lifeless, motionless body up, 
It was in that moment that the gravity and the finality of what was happening really hit me. That there's no hope here. That there's no, oh, dad just needs to rest a little longer. He just needs to get a different medication. He just needs some time to recover. No, in that moment, it hit me. My dad is gone. I'm going to live the rest of my earthly life without my father. Death, the word dead, is dark. Death is difficult. Death is depressing. Death is a disturbing reality. Charles Spurgeon, when he was preaching from this very text in Ephesians chapter 2, he said this so well. He said, the thought is overwhelming to me that soon this body of mine will be a carnival of worms. Spurgeon said, death does such an awful work with us. It's a vandal of this mortal fabric. He said, endeavor as you can to get the idea of a corpse. And when you have so done, understand that the metaphor is that of Scripture, to set forth the condition of your soul by nature. And Charles Spurgeon was exactly right. Scripture says, the Apostle Paul says, Ephesians chapter 2 says that you, yes you, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sin. To trespass means to go someplace that you were never meant to go. And of course, to sin means to do something or to be something that you were never intended by God to be. In other words, church, we're so far from what God meant us to be that when the Bible searches for language to explain how far we've fallen from intimacy and relationship with God and his plan and his purpose and his goal for us as his people, the best word to describe this fall from grace is dead. It's the best word to summarize our condition. The image is that of a funeral home. It's that of a corpse. It's the image of being lifeless and hopeless. You know, every so often we as a, a society, um, as a human race, will encounter some horrible act of evil. And for the next few days, what tends to happen is every news outlet and everybody on Twitter and social media will get online and they'll ponder evil and they'll look for causation, and they'll try to point fingers at why this, that, or the other happened. In other words, people will say, well, this act of evil happened because of the environment of the perpetrator, the home that they grew up in, the society that surrounded them. This school shooting happened because of a lack of laws, government failure, regulatory failure. This heinous crime was a result result of a lack of moral and spiritual decay. This mass murder was because of the shooter, the the perpetrator having an internal chemical mental imbalance. In other words, we as people, we're constantly looking to shift blame. We're looking for causation in all these different places. And I think sometimes we have the idea, even as Christians, that Scripture just grabs and addresses one strand of these very complicated causations but that's not really an accurate view of what the Bible teaches. The Bible says yes to all the above. Yes, there's a spiritual darkness. Yes, there's a moral decay within the fabric of our society. Yes, there's a social component, a a, a cultural component. Yes, there's an environmental explanation. Yes, there's things that we need to do as people with authority and opportunity and, and, and a voice that we can do to fight against these things that are happening in the world. Scripture says, though, that you were dead when you were walking and following the course of this world. You are following the world, which means that, yes, that peer pressure is real. Yes, the demonic influence, um, oppression, and even possession plays a part in these evil acts. Yes, social conformity is real. And it impacts our values. It impacts our attitude. It impacts our behavior and our response to what's happening in and around us. For many of us, we just kind of live in the streams that we grew up in around our family and our friends and our community, doing what they're doing, saying what they're saying, responding the way they would respond. And and far too often, we never stop to think, what does God say about this? How does God want me to respond? How does God want me to act? How does God want me to lead through this? 
And so the reality is, if you think about it, is we float along the stream, we go down the path, just like the rest of the world, away from honoring our creator, our maker, and our God, and we just kind of float down the stream towards whatever it is that we want to do. And that's what Paul's saying here, that we were following, just kind of floating along, following the prince of the power of the air, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Meaning there's a demonic spiritual component that pulls us away from the plans and the purposes of God. We're actually following the devil. We're following the prince of the power of the air. But there's also an internal component. Our culture is not going to want to hear this, but there's a personal component to this as well, which means none of us are victims. We're not victims of the society in which we live. We're not victims of the bad parents we may have had. We're not victims of, of, of whatever fabric we have found ourselves going through. We are not victims. The reality is all of us have had moments where we thought, man, I know that I'm, what I'm wanting to do is not the most loving thing to do. I know what I'm thinking about doing is not going to be the most beneficial thing to me or to those around me. I know that what I'm, I'm wanting to do here is not beautiful or God-honoring or according to Scripture, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that's Paul's point. He's saying, hey, all of us, not most of us, all of us have stepped into the darkness all of us have by our very depraved nature our children of wrath just like everyone else in mankind. And therefore the result of that reality is that all of us, every single one of us, are dead. Yes, you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Alexander Solzhenitsyn had a great quote about this. He put it this way. He said, if only there were evil people insidiously committing evil deeds somewhere over there. And all we had to do was gather them and eradicate them. He said, but the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every man. And the implications of that reality is if we're just gonna wipe out evil, we're gonna get rid of evil then the fact of the matter is we're all too inextricably linked. We're all in trouble. We're all guilty. None of us are victims. We're all part of the problem. We're all in a bad place. We are all children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. Now, maybe you're hearing this and you're thinking, Ew, what a great day to come to church. <laughs> come on, Pastor Tim, I'm not that bad, bro. Like, take it easy. I'm not a terrible person. I've known some terrible people. I've lived with terrible people. I've seen them around. I, I know a terrible person when I see one, and I'm not that. So to call me dead, to call me a child of wrath, that seems a little dramatic, Pastor Tim. That seems too strong, too harsh. Okay, let me explain it to you like this for the rest of the time that we have. Did you know that Jesus brought three different people who were dead back to life. Three different people. One was Jairus' daughter. She was a 12-year-old girl, and she wasn't dead very long. The story goes that when she was about to die, her father, Jairus, in a, in a moment of desperation, runs to find Jesus. He begs Jesus. He says, Jesus, please come with me to my house. My daughter's there. She's about to die. Come heal her. But as they make their way to the house where the little girl was on her deathbed, one of his servants comes out and meets them and said, it's too late. Your daughter, your little girl is dead. When they got to the house, they found the mother holding this lifeless body of their child. Friends and family were there. They were mourning. They were grieving. They were crying. They were weeping over the death of this child. But Jesus shows up. He steps in and he raises her from death to life. She had been dead for a few minutes. Another story from scripture, another person that Jesus raised from death to life was a young man. The story goes that Jesus was walking into the town of Nain and he saw a funeral procession going by, which means that this young man had probably been dead according to their culture and tradition and the way that they would conduct a funeral in the first century. He was probably dead for about a day. 
And then, of course, the third person that Jesus raised from the dead, from death to life, was a friend of Jesus, and his name was Lazarus. And the scripture tells us that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Now, what's interesting about these three people is you've got a little girl who had been dead for minutes. You have a young man who had been dead for about a day, and you have Lazarus who had been dead for several days to the point that when Jesus showed up and said, roll the stone away, open up the tomb, <laughs> Lazarus's loved ones, namely his sisters, were like, no, 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 Jesus, don't do it. He's going to stink. He's already decomposing. It's too late for that. In other words, these three people were in three different conditions. Like if you had seen that little girl, she would have looked pretty good. She would have still had color in her face. She would have still been warm to the touch. She would have still smelled good and looked good. Her mom was still literally holding her in her arms. The young man who had been dead for about a day, he would have had more evidence of corruption. He would have looked more like death than the little girl. He would have been stiff to the touch. I'm sure he would have been ice cold. He would have been pale. And then there's Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. He would have been gross. He would have stunk to high heaven. You couldn't walk anywhere near his dead body without going, oh. It would have been horrendous. He would have been scary because he would have been clearly showing the evidence of corruption. But as we said a few weeks ago, dead is dead. There ain't levels of dead. There's not grades of dead. There's not uh, uh, degrees of dead. Remember we talked about the, the wizard from The Princess Bride? Funny line, terrible theology because you can't be mostly dead. There's no mostly dead. Dead is dead. There's just dead. In other words, all that was different, and hear me on this, all that was different about these three people was how much of the corruption of death had come to the surface. It's the only difference. So spiritually, what we tend to do is we say, well, I'm not really that dead. I'm not really dead at all. I mean, I'm not bad because I look around and I see rapists and pedophiles and murderers and all these horrible people doing crazy things and crazy stuff, and that's true. There are some unbelievably evil people doing unbelievably evil things in the world. But all that means, church, is that they simply have more of the outward signs of corruption than you do. At the end of the day, if you're without Christ, you are still dead. You just may smell nicer and look a little bit better. So according to our text, that's the bad news. We were all dead, all of us, because of our sin. But praise be to God, just like in each one of those moments, Jesus came stepping in. In other words, after all this bad news, verse four says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive in Christ. In other words, when Jesus Christ stepped up to that house where that little girl had died literally in her mother's arms, Jesus touched her and said, Talitha Kumi, which means I say to you, little girl, rise. And some of you have been good little girls your whole life, but spiritually, apart from Jesus Christ, you're not alive. You're dead. But praise be to God, Jesus has come to you and is saying, Talitha Kumi, young girl, I say to you, arise. He's saying that to you this morning. <laughs> and then Jesus stepped up to that young man, to the funeral of the young man. I, I just love this scene. It's like he walks into town, sees his funeral going by. It says that Jesus saw the boy's mother, that she was a widow. She had no other children. And he sees her grief. He sees her broken heart. He sees the grief of the friends who have gathered around her. And I love this moment because Jesus sees this funeral procession taking place. And he's like, you know what? No, I'm not, not in the mood for this today. Not happening. I'm shutting this funeral down. 
I just imagine the pallbearers who are doing their diligence, literally carrying the body of their friend to his place of burial. They're like, who's this guy? Uh, Sir, what exactly are you doing? And Jesus is like, we're not having a funeral today. We're not doing it. Here's exactly how scripture puts it. Luke 7, 14. Jesus came up and touched the buyer. That's the platform on which they were carrying the, the body on. He came up and touched the buyer and Jesus said, young man, I say to you, Arise. And then Jesus stepped up to the tomb of Lazarus. Again, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Again, his family was saying, Jesus, we know you. Not like the funeral procession where they didn't know Jesus. They knew Jesus. Jesus, we know what you're, we know what you're thinking, Jesus. Don't do it. Don't get involved. His body is going to stink. Don't, don't you do it. He's been dead for far too long. And Jesus said, I know. I know that the corruption of death has already taken place, but dead is dead. So roll that stone away and Lazarus, come forth. Some of you are still saying, and you're still thinking about your own life. And you're like, again, Pastor Tim, I, I feel like I'm not that bad. Not that bad of a person. I don't feel like I'm dead. I think this is a little dramatic, a little bit overstated in my opinion. Okay. According to scripture, if you are without Jesus and the forgiveness of sins that he offers to you as a free gift, then the corruption of said sin and the corruption of death that is the result of said sin is upon you. It's in you. But thanks be to God, Jesus is bringing little girls and young men from death to life. But then there's others of you in the house of God today who might be thinking, you know, Pastor Tim, I, I'm actually on the other end of this. I think I'm too far gone. Like, Pastor Tim, you don't know how sinful I've been. You don't know how far back my rebellion goes. You don't realize how corrupt my thought life has been and the things that nobody even knows that I've done, how ungodly I have been for decades. The stain of my sin runs too deep. Well, no, I, I don't think you know. It's actually much worse than you think it is. I've just spent 30 minutes trying to t tell you, trying to let you know that it's worse than you even imagine. But praise be to God, Jesus Christ has stepped up and he's come into even the Lazaruses in here today. Jesus has come to those of us who have already felt like we've decomposed and he's saying, no, 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 not today. Come forth into a new life in me. That's the message of Christianity. That's the message of the gospel. You and I, yes, you, yes, me, we were dead, but God being rich in mercy, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Amen. In other words, Jesus isn't forgiving you and saving you because he thinks you're a good investment. Jesus isn't saving you and forgiving you because he thinks you're better than most and kind of drawing the line, I'll take the top 30 and ignore the other 70. Jesus isn't forgiving you and saving you because he's just unaware and underestimated how, just, how dead you were. Your, your sin, your past, your, your thoughts, the, the secret sins of your life isn't going to surprise him. Rather, Jesus forgives and he saves because of himself, because of his mercy, because of his grace, because of his great love. Jesus saves because he's rich in a covenant-making compassion that stoops towards the hurting that stoops towards the dead and calls them to life. Can we give Jesus praise this morning as a church? He deserves it. <laughs> Listen, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And so the question is this. It's simple, but it's profound. And it's worth taking seriously. I ask you today, are you dead or are you alive? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not asking if your church attendance has been above average or not. I'm not asking if you're giving or tithing like, you're sh like you should. I'm not asking you if you're reading your Bible X amount of minutes or chapters a day. I'm not asking if you're better 
or worse than other people. I'm not asking you if you've made a resolution to sin a little bit less or to love and serve a little bit more. I'm asking you, are you dead or are you alive? And I want you to know that by nature, the moment you breathed air's first breath, you were born depraved. You were born with a sin nature. You were born spiritually dead. But if you're in Christ, then you've been made alive. So I'm gonna ask everyone in this building today to just bow your head, close your eyes, and I want you to talk to God. You've heard me talking about God, but just talk to him. You say, I don't know what to say. Just talk to him. Consider what God has said to you already this morning. Here's what the, the word of God says. It says that the wages or the result of sin is death. Meaning if you've sinned one time, and I know you've sinned more than that, but even if you've just sinned once, then the result of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The word of God also says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, meaning you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Bible says then you will be saved. For many of you here at Faith Community Church, you gave your life to Jesus, you responded to his offer of, of adoption, of salvation, of forgiveness, of eternal life, maybe decades ago. But I believe that there's some under the sound of my voice today who you realize that today is the day. March 5th, 2023, at the nine o'clock service of Faith Community Church in Tucson, Arizona, that was the day that I realized that I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. If you know that that's you today and you need to be made alive in Christ, then I wanna pray with you even right now. And you can say it as loudly or as quietly as you want, but just talk to God. That's all prayer is. It's simply talking to God. Just say, Jesus, I recognize that today you are the only one who can save me. So Jesus, I ask that you take my sin, take my death, and give me life. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth, even right now, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And now, Father, I pray for those who have responded by faith and through grace that you've given us to receive your forgiveness and to receive the salvation that you offer to us even now. For those who have made the choice to be taken from death to life by and through Jesus. And God, my prayer is that they'll go all the way that they'll follow you in water baptism, that they'll submit to your lordship, your leadership, and to obey your decrees. I pray, God, that they would be filled and led by your spirit, not by their flesh, but God, they'd be filled with your spirit and thus pursue the righteousness of God in their life. And God, for those of us who <laughs> received Christ many years ago, who were made alive maybe decades ago. May we continue to rely on Jesus for daily leadership as we relied on him the day that we came to Christ. May we keep our focus. May we keep our eyes on Jesus. May we persevere until the end. And Lord, we all say thank you, Jesus, that because of you, death has no sting and life has no end. And if you agree with this prayer, church, can you just give Jesus Christ an ovation of worship, celebration, and praise? He's worthy. Amen.